So let me just say a few words about our next monitor, Rob Blumenthal. Um, most of you know him as managing director at Deutsche Bank Securities, and he's been a um, adjunct associate professor for uh, NYU for a number of years. But what I really want to say is that um, we've had this conference for many, many years, but when Rob took it over, he had a vision to take it to another level. And clearly, um, this great conference wouldn't be what it is today without Rob. And um, he's just gone out and got the best people anywhere in the world to speak at this conference. So he deserves uh, an extra round of applause. Thanks, uh, Jimmy, for that kind words. Um, who was here last year? Raise your hand. OK. Remember this panel? We almost had a fist fight in the stage. We want to make it even a bigger fight tonight, uh, today. Meaning not a fight, but a dialogue where we challenge each other. So I encourage our panelists to uh, interrupt each other, jump in. Uh, we have a little less than an hour, and we want to make sure everyone gets a shot at uh, doing something. I'm here because I've been told by my security down at Deutsche Bank that we're actually not allowed out of 60 walls, so because of the Occupy Wall Street people. So luckily, we're all here. Uh, amazing. So um, this is a very uh, diverse panel, and we have a lot of topics we can cover versus the other panels, which were very focused on debt or just private equity. And so I'm just going to throw out uh, a, a first uh, question to the group. Uh, we've seen the, the specter of distress. Everyone talked about distress. Is, is the refinance uh, bubble a distressed investment opportunity, a new lending opportunity, or the apoc apoc apocalypse? So, uh, Kia, if you're in the market looking at distressed situations, uh, do you see this as uh, really being there yet? I think for our portfolio, uh, you know, we saw the run-up at the beginning of He's the year. He's talking to the speaker. Yeah. Sorry. We saw the run-up at the beginning of the year, uh, and then it felt like things died. And Fortunately, um, you know, we got some great things financed at the beginning of the year, and then it feels like July, August, everything started to slow down a lot. As an opportunistic investor, it's an opportunity, so it just depends on which side you're on. I think that we've seen a, a big change in the market since the summer, uh, really as a result of people getting a little too excited that there was a recovery underway. I think we overshot ourselves a little bit on the capital side. Uh, and we're seeing a lot better opportunities um, right now than probably about a year ago. Ethan, uh, those who don't know Ethan, he basically started, in my opinion, the CNBS industry when he was at Nomura. So By the Ethan, way, whose opinion is more important than yours, Rob? <laughs> so Ethan, I mean, is this, is, this, is this refinancing bubble a lending opportunity or an opportunity to take advantage of problems? I'm not sure how I answer that question. I think I'm just going to say that I, uh, when you look at opportunities and you measure whether it's an opportune time to invest or not, it really always comes down to a function of the supply of capital and the demand for capital, which is presented by sellers or people in need of capital. And I think that uh, what's characterized the last few years is that the supply of capital seeking deals uh, outs has outstripped the deals seeking capital. And uh, I agree with Kia that in the last year or year and a half, there have been some optimistic assumptions based on uh, expectations of recovery that have been factored into people's pricing. And I think that people are now starting to second guess that, that basic belief. But at the same time, so I, so I think that what deals do come is not being chased with the same fervor, pricing fervor, that we witnessed perhaps over the last year or year and a half, but at the same time, I think that the supply of deal flow is still very sparse. And I think that really has kept a, 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 a limited amount of opportunity and has frustrated people in this market for the last year or two who really were salivating, hopeful, hoping that this dislocation would create a second RTC. Now, that may yet come. Uh, but for the time being, it seems like we're still in this period of time where the, the amount of opportunities seeking capital is still not numerous enough for people to be too excited about. Can I get controversial, though? 
I actually think it ends up being about valuation. I agree with you, because I think that the capital that is there to invest has just higher expe return expectations than the sellers. Because I think that, you know, you have to get to market clearing prices and we're in that imbalance because I hear people <coughs> complain there's no deals, there's no deals. Well, there's no deals at the numbers you want them. That doesn't mean that's a good thing, but I just think that there's a optimism on owner side, a pessimism on buyer side, and we're in that market where, you know, we're not, we're not in balance. It's really just a question of capital going in wants to get paid, a, you know, a premium right now. Sellers aren't willing to, to give that. Can, you see a, can I, can I yeah, we'll, we'll go down, but Scott, let's go to Scott and we'll get to you in a second. But Scott, you've been on both sides of being a <laughs> Sorry. CEO of a, a major public REIT that you sold successfully, and now you're running a very successful new uh, fund. Um, I mean, do you see distress out there where you can take advantage of things? Because you've actually been paying up for some significant assets in the city very successfully. So they haven't been distressed situations, they've been yeah. new purchases. Where do you see it? I mean, I, I think that the, um, again, it could come, I think she's point about finding the, the bid ask and finding that sweet spot's a fair point. Um, and I think actually what you saw, at least in the debt markets, that hit that point early, first was that it got frothy, as did some of the uh, general for sale market. And people forgot to sort of value the, the risk element that was out there. And I think what this pullback we've seen probably has placed it where most of us rationally would think it would be placed in terms of more conservative underwriting, wider spreads, and I think more appropriately priced uh, debt and asset sales. And I think, frankly, we're going to see more transaction flow because I think it also has been a wake-up call for owners uh, and potential sellers that there's downside of just holding your assets, where there was a period of time was that the longer you held it, prices were going up, so you look smart doing it. I think that what we've seen is we've seen unnatural owners or people that need liquidity willing to price it appropriately to move assets today more so than they would have, uh, I would say, the end of the second quarter where pricing was getting, was getting frothy. Um, and so I think this is a good, healthy dynamic, and I think going to 2012, it's going to create good transaction activity um, and I think there's going to be a place to be a, a good value-added investor um, and, and get good risk-adjusted returns by either filling some of that capital uh, stack that needs to be filled as part of recapitalizations or, or, or refinancings or, or buying assets where you can add, uh, add value uh, across the board. But just broad distress, I, I haven't seen broad distress in the marketplace, and I'm not sure we're going to see broad macro distress in the marketplace. Ralph, you're, you, you've been brought in by KKR, one of the largest you know, opportunity funds, funds out there in the world to grow a real estate franchise. Are you going to see your opportunities from distressed situations or focusing on newer opportunities and, and special asset classes, et cetera? Sure. <clears throat> I would say I think that there are going to be interesting opportunities in the distressed world, but also in effectively the real money world. The fact is that all the capital structures that got created between 2005 and 2007 have to ultimately be recalibrated to reflect the actual value associated with the underlying assets. And therefore, these capital structures are going to have to effectively reinvent themselves. That's going to require flexible capital. It's going to come in the form of debt. It's going to come in the form of equity. And I do believe that return expectations are going to come down in the marketplace to the extent that real interest rates stay at effectively zero, and the 10-year forward curve is showing a yield of 3% out to 2016, it's just anachronistic that the investors who gravitated towards funds to try to earn you know, 18 to 22% opportunistic returns, that absolute return threshold just doesn't practically exist in the marketplace with realistic assumptions in a GDP growth environment that effectively is 2.5% nominal and 1.5% real. So I do think you're going to see, the, to Ethan's point, you're going to see the demand for opportunities sort of clear the marketplace with the supply of capital that I think is going to reinvent itself over the next handful of years to more realistic absolute return expectations relative to the real rate of return. Richard, of all the panelists up here, you've been the most successful, in my opinion, of taking advantage of distressed situations, buying some of the largest portfolios successfully. So what's your view in terms of distress versus new opportunities for you? Sure. 
Uh, you know, look, I, I agree with most of what everybody else has said already on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, we've been extraordinarily busy, per your point, Rob. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've invested more than $3 billion, mainly in distress, uh, and that's because we've been willing to find or seek out those nooks and crannies where uh, the air is thinner, uh, it's a little bit less competitive, uh, things like FDIC auctions, uh, lots of small loans as an example. Um, and, uh, you know, in those places, uh, if you're willing to deal with ambiguity, uh, meaning that you're not really sure uh, at the time that you close exactly what the future outcome is going to be, uh, you really have to roll up your sleeves, uh, be prepared to do a lot of restructuring work, uh, where the outcomes uh, could be ver varied and numerous uh, in terms of ultimately what happens. Could be you have to foreclose, could be you're going to do a loan modification, uh, could be a discounted payoff, could be a variety of different outcomes. Um, we've also gone to Europe. We were there earlier, uh, but certainly now it's unfolding as a very big opportunity, and I think, again, the air is somewhat thinner, less people with boots on the ground like we have. Uh, in terms of really being in that market and prepared uh, to take advantage of the opportunity. Um, but I also think Ralph's point about interest rates and where return levels are uh, is kind of key in terms of understanding what's happening in the market today. I mean, this is not 20 years ago when, uh, first of all, there was no capital available for real estate. And interest rates, if you looked at the 10-year Treasury, I don't recall exactly what it was, but it was closer to 10% than closer to zero like it is today. So in this environment, if you can earn, in our opinion, kind of mid-teens, uh, unlevered returns in restructuring and in distress, uh, that's really great kind of relative to what else you could be doing. So Richard, uh, before we get to Wendy, $3 billion is a lot of money to invest in you know, distressed loans, although we sort of did that at Bankers Trust when I was there. Um, from the day you started investing till now, what percent of, of par value when you first did your initial bids, what cents in a dollar were you bidding you know, versus Robert, and where, where the market has evolved into, which is a sign of, of the growing competition or maybe the recovery? Well, for, first of all, I mean, there's no, as a general matter, certainly spreads have come in a little bit, yields have come in a little bit, certainly a couple of hundred basis points as versus where we started a couple of years ago. But, it, but if you look at the spectrum of what we've paid, I mean, it's been from the low end, maybe 15 cents on the dollar, to the high end in the high 70s, with an average being in the low 50s. So, Wendy, you are the only um, REIT on the panel, and I think because Vernado is in a u unique position for being in a, in a bunch of different markets, where do you see from a, a public REIT perspective, uh, is, is, is distress your future opportunity? You bought, you bought a special servicer. Or is it new opportunity going forward? Well, I, I want to say first, I agree with um, Richard that there's a tremendous amount of distress in the world. We see it through LNR. We see it through you know deals that we look at and pass on. But that's primarily because as a REIT, we're not really a trading vehicle, and so we're looking to acquire assets that we can you know hopefully hold long term on our balance sheet. But I do agree that you know between the coasts. Um, certainly, if you're not in the major metropolitan areas, there's plenty of distress, and you know Richard has done as good a job as anybody is tapping into that market through the FDIC, et cetera. For us, you know, in markets like New York City and Washington, D.C., which is where the predominance of our holdings are, there have been, more so in New York than in Washington, distressed situations. But the fact of the matter is there's so much capital chasing so few deals in these markets, and this capital is coming not just from the types of people sitting on this panel, but from all over the world, that even things that, quote, should be distressed get bid up to almost premium pricing. So for us, the focus has really been on participating in recapitalizations and, quite frankly, looking for some sort of very hands-on repositioning opportunity, which for us is one way of making the air a little bit thinner. 
um, where there's perhaps still competition but less of it, so that we'll take a 500,000 square foot block of space that needs to be leased in New York, and that's difficult to underwrite, but you know that's what you get paid to do. And then of course the question is, given this low interest rate environment, how much are you really getting paid to take on this increased risk? Well, if you know fully occupied, stable buildings in New York City are going for five, maybe even sub five percent cap rates, you would hope that you were making an eight, nine, ten percent return to take on that risk. I'll tell you that you're not. So I think that there is distress in the marketplace, but again, depending upon the market, you're not necessarily getting paid a huge premium for it, and that's part of the challenge. But if you're going to be selective about your markets, that's what we're finding. Yeah, but why, you, you have huge liquidity, as do a lot of the public REITs, so why haven't you been more aggressive, other than the competitive situation in New York City, using your currency to acquire assets? We haven't seen a lot of REITs going out there and doing major major acquisitions. Is, is 2012 going to be that moment in time where you start using that liquidity? Well, I mean, the, you know, the thing about using your currency is that somebody has to want it, so that's the first step. Um, I it's think a stock through an upreach structure, right? Yeah, the stock in an upreach structure. The benefit of using your stock, obviously, is that it's great for any sort of estate planning or Quite frankly, if people just don't want to take the proceeds in cash and pay taxes if they have a tax issue. So I think that we found that on certain asset deals, people, individuals who are in that situation often will want to take a combination of cash and stock. And those aren't necessarily deals that are very high profile, so you won't hear a lot about them. I think in terms of doing company mergers, I mean, you know, the last time we tried to do a huge company merger was with EOP, where we were offering $10 billion of stock. The issue is that the other side has to want to take it. So I think that, you know, those situations are selective. They could happen. Um, you know, the reality is, we can talk about this in the context of some of the other questions, but REIT stocks right now are trading like financial institution stocks. There's a lot of volatility in them. It makes it difficult to you know, plan a large merger or acquisition using a stock that has that much volatility. Hey, Ethan, you know, at, at uh, the earlier panels, it sounds like you know, there's a lot of money in the private equity world. They all still want leverage. Since you invented or helped invent the start of leverage in the public markets, what is going to be the new format to finance the potential acquisitions of those on the panel here? I mean, do you have the, do you have access to the liquidity well, I, I and the think ability that to finance There's this? two answers to that question. On, on the one hand, I think that there's probably on new acquisitions, and I think everybody would probably agree with this on this panel and even on prior panels, there's a real sense that the world is adjusting to a lower leverage capital structure and that the preponderance of leverage that's available through the existing systems is abundantly available up to, call it, 60% loan value, and then it's kind of very sparsely available beyond that. And so that's going to have a material impact on pricing. What we've seen, though, as the second part of the answer to your question, is that with the tremendous amount of extensions that are being granted, remember, less than half of the loans that matured in the last year were actually repaid through some refinancing or sale. So more than half of the loans in 2011 that were scheduled to mature were granted extensions. So what we're seeing is that tomorrow's lenders are yesterday's lenders. They're unwitting lenders or unwilling lenders. People that thought they bought bonds that mature in 10 years might find themselves holding bonds that mature in 20 years. And that's who a lot of, a lot of tomorrow's lenders will be yesterday's lenders that just can't get out. And those capital structures are very highly leveraged. So on the margin, a fund may come in and say, I'll inject some new money into an asset if I get this extension on favorable terms. The extension is granted, and you find yourself in a super high leverage position with all the upside. And that may be, so, so you've got a tale of two cities, I think, which is kind of come clean, refinance, low leverage. You come in and inject equity with extensions, very high leverage. Yeah, before I get to Kia, I have a question specific for Kia, so just hold off. But this is for, for, for Scott and Ralph. You are users of capital, right? We're all lenders are here saying what they can do. That doesn't really matter. It's what would you want as a borrower and leverage to do your business? You know, what do you need? And then let us, whether it be Jonathan Pollock or others or our insurance company professionals, to, cr to craft leverage to allow you 
to grow your businesses. Let's first Scott and then, and then Ralph. And, uh, and then I, I think that uh, Ethan characterized it perfectly in terms of the detail of the two types of lending environments. And we've uh, invested in about $3 billion of real estate in, uh, in New York over the last 12 months. And most of it was value-added type opportunities where there's vacancy, transitioning, broken capital structures with complexity. And we've placed on 50 to 55 percent leverage um, and the rest was equity and it's long-term leverage to, uh, 12 years uh, we're not and, and our sort of view is uh, we're big believers that New York is going to continue to uh, correct and recover and spike up it's just a matter of time and we may have some steps backwards before we go forwards but if you have a conservative capital structure with a lot of, of that time and you have patient capital you're ultimately going to get there and when you when you view these investments a lot of those returns are based on uh, where you can drive rents by the time you're ready to revert uh, on the sale. And so being able to have that patience is, is critical. Um, on the other side, we have also done a lot where we've actually bought MES uh, or bought debt where we then have done A note, B note structures with existing lenders and find ourselves in these uh, situations where we're injecting capital in places that we're comfortable um, and then using that capital to create value and getting the upside associated with so, that. So specifically, Scott, you bought a bunch, one of the most active acquirers of New York City real estate. Specifically, what was the capital structures on some of the three, two or three largest deals? Yeah, again, again, 50 to 55 percent. And what are the buildings? So just people like, know. So Starrett Lehigh uh, is 50 percent leverage, 55 percent leveraged. Uh, the rest is all equity, and it's, it's got a 12-year loan on it. 340 Madison uh, was an 80% levered uh, transaction that Broadway Partners and Lehman had a syndication on that we bought a 49% interest uh, and then deleveraged it to 50% uh, with 12-year uh, interest on it. And again, it's 90 plus percent lease, so that was a broken capital structure. Uh, 1330 Avenue in the Americas is 70% lease and was going through repositioning from a Maclow foreclosure. Uh, we bought that uh, with uh, less than 50% leverage and uh, are in the process of repositioning. Uh, that asset. Um, uh, we're in the process right now of acquiring 620 Avenue of the Americas, which has debt in place today, which is one of the reasons that we decided to go forward with it. Uh, that's about, I would say, 55% uh, leverage, and that's a little shorter term, 2016. So I think, I think our view is we don't want to bet on the interest rates. We like these interest rates. We can underwrite the real estate. I think, as Wendy said, we're also focused on creating value, buy it right, uh, grow the NOI, how do we grow that NOI, and then be in a market where there's liquidity when you want to sell, um, and, and not be in a situation where we're leveraging up using floating rate debt. I mean, frankly, if we were, and that goes to a little bit of Ralph's point, I mean, if you want to leverage up and use floating rate debt, we could take our returns, which we're saying, let's say our mid-teens type returns uh, when you go through it all, um, and make them 20s, but you're, it's, a, it's, a, it's a risky game that uh, we don't want to play nor do our investors. So, Ralph, how, is we, how could we as bankers help finance your business specifically? Well, I'm just curious also, what is the cost, just to kind of show the numbers, the cost of like 55% debt on New York City? Yeah, so on, on for, our... For 12-year money. Right, so on the um, 340 Madison uh, was 5%. And that was done in July. Uh, you know, good, a good example just on this debt point, and I was actually commenting to Richard, on this, uh, our Starry Lehigh building, we put $500 million of leverage on that. Uh, we got four and three-eighths that climbs to, I think, four and three-quarters uh, interest only for uh, an extended period of time. But, you know, to your point about using bankers, we were talking to you, we were talking to other banks in, uh, on the street. We ended up going with the balance sheet lender, and we closed that financing the Friday before the S&P downgraded uh, the U.S. And, you know, the, the reality is if we didn't get that closed or if we went with one of the CMBS lenders, we probably wouldn't have gotten that closed. Uh, uh, or not if we with did, Deutsche Bank. We would have closed it. Well, you, well, you, then you would have <laughs> lost 50 or $60 million potentially on that trade. And so it's, it's a scary, you know, it, it, it was a wake-up call a little bit, though, in the sense that, you know, here you are underwriting a trade. You have a big deposit up. It's a $900 million investment, and you, there's an, an active market where people are bidding aggressively to put this debt on one day, and then one month later, it, it, you know, it vaporizes. And so I think that uncertainty that's out there, um, even for us who you know, thought we were appreciating the risk, was even a wake-up call again to say you got to really appreciate that risk. And that's something that is bringing, I think, those, that bid sell, that the, the price compl uh, yes. compression together where the the bid and the ask are coming to be uh, more effective. So, Ralph, how cautious. do we help you finance your business? Sure. Um, I'll answer that under the backdrop of the following observation, which is 
between 1991 and 2006, anybody in this room who is long and levered in the commercial real estate business was a winner. There was GDP growth, there was employment growth, and there was relatively benign interest rates. In the environment that we're in now, I think we can all acknowledge that it's a lot less certain as to what the outlook is on each of those three fundamental macro variables that effectively have a lot to do with the performance of our investments from today in the spot market going forward. So as a result of that, I think we all need to be like super prudent about how we capitalize our investments. So as a result, I'm in Scott's camp, which is we are in the process of closing on three transactions right now. The maximum leverage we're taking on is 65%. That allows us to create a levered cash on cash return that's in the high single digits. Our underwritings are effectively to a 14 to 16 or 17% IRR. We've got the benefit of having some flexible capital in the KKR stable where we can effectively shoot for absolute returns in that, in that range given the real interest rate environment they're in. And if you think about it, the incremental cost of borrowing from call it 60 or 65% to 75 or 80%, in our world, we'd rather be the writer of that paper and actually originate MEZ than effectively be a consumer of that paper and borrow the MEZ. One of the three deals that we're actually closing on is we're actually originating a piece of MEZ that's a 14% piece of paper. We think we're effectively going from 65 to 83% of a capital structure in a hotel where we actually like the risk reward of that 14% piece of paper relative to the equity in that, piece, in that capital structure. So Kia, just to move things along, that's great. Um, you're one of the few folks on the panel here who has actually successfully done new construction. And we all wish we can get a reservation at the Standard Hotel or be cool enough to eat in one of the restaurants. I couldn't get in the club, I'm sure, or stay up that late. I, I can't so, get in um, but, but you've done a bunch of new construction. It's a real contrarian view to everything we heard so far. Why has Dune Capital been so successful? I guess that's to be determined, but we hope to be successful in this new construction. And where have you done it, if you can disclose it? Um, sure. I'd hate to get tagged as the development fund, but um, it's only a small piece of what we do. I think that um, our, we don't do a lot of development. We just happen to have a few high-profile developments. Um, and our focus is on assets, whether they're existing or um, to be created, that someone might overpay for in time. That's not your base case, but at, you know, unique is an overused term in real estate. Um, but it's clear that the standard hotel here in New York, um, you know, what was going on in the meatpacking district and what was going to happen with the High Line, um, that that's an asset that we thought um, over time someone would pay a price that's probably uneconomical to traditional real estate investors, um, but that it would be meaningful in someone's portfolio. And, um, you know, that asset also, uh, you know, to, uh, to be... Um, to be honest about it, was over budget. Um, you know, that often happens in development. Um, but I think that we were over budget for the right reasons. It was more, it was scope changes. Um, it was a difficult time. Uh, that was during the worst of construction costs. Um, but I think we we're focused on creating an asset that really could stand the test of time. Um, we are also, you know, um, it's been in the press. We are working with Larry Silverstein, who I know is here later. Uh, we're developing the Four Seasons Resort inside the park at uh, Disney. Uh, it's a new resort development, which does sound um, like an odd time to be doing development. Um, but again, we believe that um, an asset inside the park on fee-owned land uh, owned by us and not Disney, the only one in the park like that, um, is an asset that will stand the test of time. Uh, and so we're very attracted to that. We're an opportunity fund, for the most part, doing distressed investments, but at the same time, focusing on assets that really are, we think, unique. Um, we did find a construction loan, fully underwritten. Um, it's not high leverage, but it is a fairly large loan. Foreign institution. Um, you know, I agree with the comments. Um, it's low leverage. One thing I want to clear up, I think there's a misunderstanding about opportunity funds and leverage. Leverage only helps the seller. Leverage doesn't help the buyer because... Um, Leverage is available to all bidders on an asset. 
and it pushes up pricing. So it's not as if opportunity funds must have leverage. If leverage is available in the market, it's, it's, it's what the market clearing leverage is. And right now it's about 50, 60 percent. Um, so, you know, I, I do believe that that's um, uh, attractive to use, it's attractive to use leverage that's appropriate for your transaction. The market tells you what's appropriate. Um, opportunity funds got into trouble for potentially for, for other reasons. The last part of the capital structure is very expensive. Um, so the 60, 65, the 14 percent in your transaction. I think that's also a function of the market became so highly structured and I don't think people understood what owning MES was, enforcement of MES, what their collateral was. So I think there's a premium attached to that, not only because high loan to value, but I think people are more cognizant of the structural risks of debt. Um, and just one more thing on, on debt. You know, we talk about this gap and the debt gap and the equity gap. You know, there's not really a gap. It's just, are people going to recognize value? And so I know there's always a lot of questions, where's the capital going to come from? And I think, as he said, there's a lot of capital. It so, might not be enough, but the people embedded in place are the capital, and it's the equity gap of the extension or the not extension. It's the people staying in who are recognizing, you know, where they need to be. The challenge is when you need to put more money into an asset. If an asset doesn't need money, there's an extension or there's um, a, not a sale and people, it might be a distressed asset, but they don't have to do anything yeah. about it. The assets that are coming to market tend to be the ones that need capital. And so I well, don't yeah, Talking about capital, I guess, let's just move on here. The, the, Wendy, in terms of public companies, do you feel you have a competitive advantage of being public against the majority? I know KCAR is public, but they're not a re. Uh, there's others here who may want to be public. Being a public company, do you have a competitive advantage to accessing capital? And frankly, if we'll go down the line very quickly. If you had a chance to be public, other than the companies that are public right now, would you go public or stay private? So, Wendy, what are the advantages of being public in terms of accessing capital? Okay. Just Clearly, public companies have an advantage accessing capital. If they didn't, you'd have to scratch your head and say, why would you ever be public? So the reality is that, yes, we can go to the equity capital markets, we can go to the preferred market, we can go to the convert market. If you're investment grade, you can go to the um, corporate bond market in unsecured debt. That's in addition to doing, you know, secure debt in all the ways that we've talked about. So I think that it's a very clear answer that we have a distinct advantage to be public in terms of accessing the capital markets. I also want to say that it didn't stop us from also within our public REIT hire, you know, creating a private equity fund. And so I have a great deal of respect and it makes me go back and doubly believe what an advantage it is to be public with respect to raising capital because after going on the road for 12 to 18 months, admittedly during a difficult period because, you know, it was right after the, the, the markets tanked, it's a lot of hard work to raise money in the private market. So so um, the short answer is, would I do it again? Yeah, if I think that access to capital is important, I think it's the best way to get it. R Richard, I mean, this, this, the brethren of yours have gone public. I mean, if you had a chance to take over an existing platform or go public, would you or would you stay private? He is public. Well, for, first of all, public, we, have, we, have a of, we have a public read. You have a public read, but in terms so, of your overall, so your overall from, opportunity, your overall fund. Yeah, but I mean, look, from our standpoint, I mean, we kind of did the same thing that Wendy just described, except we did it the opposite way. Right. All right. We, we've raised substantially most of our capital over the years from private sources, but more recently, two years ago, we formed a public REIT uh, to diversify our capital sources. And, you know, I think we're delighted that we did it because, uh, you know, when we raised money through the public company, uh, the private market, as Wendy was saying, uh, you know, was really kind of dead as a doornail. Um, now, more recently, the public markets have become incredibly volatile. Uh, and interestingly enough, the private market, albeit very gradually and at somewhat of a snail's pace, uh, is coming back day by day. Uh, and we're having great success raising money privately. Um, but coming back to the answer or the question of just public versus private, uh, you know, all things being equal, which is a huge preamble, uh, I think you'd rather be private. Ethan, uh, and, and the reason you would rather be private is when you're public, one, you've got to deal with the price volatility, 
And two, you have to deal with managing to uh, quarterly earnings uh, as versus maybe making the best strategic long-term decision for your business. If you finance both public and private entities, what would you do? Well, I think that um, to Wendy's point, you know, being public and having a market cap as large as Vornado's is a much different tale than being public and having a market cap like um, Richard's REIT. It's a different deal. I, I think that, um, as Richard suggests, there are definitely uh, costs, both uh, actual costs and psychic costs, to be running a public company. I think there are huge disadvantages to running a public company in our business because you trade at the vagaries of the, of the stock market, and, and so the level of sophistication applied to understanding the details of your business almost necessarily means that at the moment in time when opportunities are greatest, you can't raise the capital you need to take advantage of it. And I think in the private market, um, you're dealing with investors who are focused exclusively on, on the real estate business. And there are real estate professionals living the business, and, and you can make appeals to them that intuitively make sense that they could respond to in moments of dislocation where I think you can raise capital to take best advantage of those dislocations. So for me, I do favor the private markets for that. Scott, reason. you're the round trip guy, right? Right. And uh, I think you have the best view of anyone on this panel. And that question, public or private? It's clearly private. Or, or both, because we have panelists. Clearly, well, clearly private. And I just, but I wanted, I think that the Ethan made a good point. Clearly and, private. And, and, is and that why there's an IPO backlog that is not going to get done in the... In the uh, it's in the clearly world. private, Rob. Clearly private. Clearly uh, private. Uh, the uh, former CEO. It's clearly private, private until you want to go public. Right. So, I mean, <laughs> well, here, here's, here's what I'm saying. There's different forms of public. Well, I think but, let's quote it. that three years from now when right. Scott has a couple billion dollars under management. Right. Clearly well, public. Clearly Here's what I want to say. I think it's important. I think that the point about Vernado is a good point in the sense that you have this huge, uh, very liquid company with a lot of uh, diversity and, uh, and, and business um, opportunities under there, very different than other public companies. And to your point about price, I think the issue is, you know, and in, in, uh, access to capital, if you're not Vernado, let's say, for example, you're in a sector that's out of favor, suburban office, so all of a sudden your multiple's high, and uh, I mean low, rather, and so your cost of capital's high. And so you all of a sudden, you don't have a good cost of capital. As a, a private investor, you can match the appropriate capital to the appropriate investment. And, and you can silo that and you can adjust quickly as markets adjust. And I think that's to Ethan's point as to when you want to have capital, you're not going to be saddled with the fact that, you know what, I'm already um, uh, preoccupied because I made this other investment here that's now maybe out of favor and now my cost of capital is too expensive. You, if you have the capabilities, you can go source that capital uh, effectively. Now we, we've been successful in competing with the public companies and, and going toe-to-toe -to -toe with an SO Green, with Vernado, and I think that our cost of capital uh, is as competitive uh, as theirs is, but we obviously don't have the benefit of being able to go access the unsecured debt market or overnight transactions, and it is a very difficult process to be able to go out and, and build a flow of private equity and a continuum of private equity to fuel your, your business and your investment strategies. Whereas on the public side, it, comes on, it can be much more efficient once you get public. It's still hard to get public, but once you get public, it can be much more, uh, much more efficient. So, uh, and then I uh, just want to say one last thing. And I think Richard's point is also a really important point. It is refreshing um, as a private investor. And this has changed from when I first went public to when we sold. When we went, first went public, there wasn't Reg FD. Um, there was an ability to actually talk to your investors and have you know, uh, strategic discussions and, and be thoughtful and not just focusing quarter to quarter but longer term. I think the public markets have shifted a lot and it's made it very difficult for a traditional public company to think long term, to stay pure and disciplined on the investment side without being more managed by the street than managing the street. And I think as a private investor, you have the benefit of your numbers are your numbers. Your team is incented by creating profits and it creates a very good alignment with your investors and there's a great open uh, dialogue and communication without having uh, some of the regulatory issues around that. So whether it be public or private, so starting with Wendy, let's do this really quick. You know, if you look forward to 2012, uh, what's your biggest opportunity? Now in the case of a REIT, it's getting that multiple up, but what do you see that, that biggest opportunity? Uh, 
I th well, but you answered the first one. I know, but you want, I, you, I want you to tell us why. It's a and a half, so that's hard to duplicate. Um, I think, you know, the biggest... Well, what, what's the magnitude of, of, let's assume you increase your multiple, what would be the magnitude of that? About a billion and a half dollars. So, so a one turn times one in your turn multiple a is a and one and a half. half. It takes a lot of work, work to that. generate a billion right. and a half dollars. Might want to work on that. Um, so, <laughs> but I think the answer is really with respect to our competitive advantage, and I agree with what everybody said, and you do have to distinguish when you answer the public company question, because there's many issues that go along with being the public company, not the least of which, no matter how good your fundamentals are, if you're a big enough REIT, some of the ones mentioned at Boston Properties and SL Green of Vornado, we're going to trade with the vagaries of what's going on in Europe, and that's just a little bit crazy, and it's not appealing, to tell you the truth. But I think, you know, because we have these advantages, Advantages with respect to capital. Right now, we probably have literally just, you know, from available lines of credit and cash, about $4 billion of buying power that we could turn on a dime to be able to do a transaction. So I think our biggest opportunity, because the ones that would make a difference in our company or really move the needle in a company our size, are not necessarily the ones that you can plan for, but the ones that will, you know, present themselves opportunistically and the ability to be able to move in some size and quickly because you have the financial wherewithal ready you know and able to do so is what I think will you know afford us the opportunities if they come along that we can seize and ones that'll make a difference if not we'll continue to do what we're doing I think pretty well which is participating in our marketplace in recaps on assets that you know probably have a broken capital structure and the need to reposition themselves so, so Richard biggest opportunity that you see to make it difference sure. in your business in 2012? Well, look, I, I think there's going to be more of the same. Uh, I think there's lots more distress to do. Uh, you know, the wall of maturities in 12, uh, loans that were originated in 2007, uh, is enormous. Uh, plus the fact that you've got some of the loans that have been extended, uh, which are about to mature. And when you combine that with Kia's comment before, that at some point these assets hit the wall because there's a cash need. Uh, there's going to be a tremendous amount of restructuring uh, that takes place in 2012, and we hope to be one of the beneficiaries of that. That means buying loans uh, at significant discounts. It also means being a high-yield lender. Uh, we do what Ralph was saying before uh, in connection with some of those recaps. It also means going over to Europe. Uh, you know, all of this uncertainty and distress over in Europe to us is enormous opportunity. And I guess the last place where we also see uh, a pretty interesting arbitrage is in kind of income producing value added uh, here in the US because a lot of the money has gone to the two ends of the spectrum, meaning either opportunistic uh, or core. Uh, and it seems like in the middle, there's a little bit more of a void and the air is somewhat thinner. Ralph, your biggest opportunity in 12. Uh, many of the world's best real estate operators and developers had relied primarily on a handful of strategic relationships between 1990 and 2006. A lot of those strategic relationships aren't available to those best-in-class operators today. I think the best opportunities that we're going to see are to effectively partner with private real estate operators who are best-in-class, help them delever and recapitalize assets that they had acquired in their portfolios between the 2004 and 2007 period and simultaneously provide them with growth capital to go and buy relatively low levered mid-teens absolute return opportunities in the marketplace. Scott? Yeah, I, I would echo a few of the comments. I think that the biggest opportunity is in this debt space and the recapitalization space. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're launching in 2012 is a, a debt initiative where we're venturing with a, another fund that focuses on debt. Um, and if you think about going back to the early 90s and these other periods, there were the Heller Financials, there were the GE, there were these slug pieces of debt that filled that gap. And, you know, not to repeat all the statistics, but there's so much debt maturing that needs to be rebalanced and recapitalized. And so if you have a effective platform that's efficient, um, that can fill that void for these refinancings and, uh, and recapitalizations, it, it's very, very healthy. I'll also uh, note that there is a tremendous amount of global capital that wants to participate on those types of risk-adjusted returns that you can get for that type of uh, debt investment. And it's very tax efficient 
for them to make those investments if structured right. So I think that, you know, that's one of the things that I think will help deleverage uh, our industry. And that's something that I think 2012, as you've heard, I think from all of us so far, is, is going to be a big opportunity on. Ethan, 2012. Um, well, I started two funds to do exactly what Scott just discussed, you know, mezzanine related. It's all about filling voids. It's about figuring out where today's system can't serve us. So in my mind, that is anything that's not on either coast, right? We have a capital markets that pretends that everything that's not on a coast is going to go to zero. And so if you're willing to go off the coast, you're doing good. There's a good opportunity to get outsized returns. Number two, as Scott mentioned in detail, anything north of 60% LTV, there's a mismatch between the availability of capital versus the need for that capital. And I think um, the other area that's interesting is small loan balance loans, right? Conduits did a basically fulfilled that need. Most of the loans in America, believe it or not, in, that are called commercial loans are under 10 million bucks. Richard knows because he's bought all of them, but um, the who's going to make those loans, right? Today, the conduit market is not really healthy, and I think that's going to be an interesting area as well. Kia? Yeah, you know, I think it's similar to what everyone said. It's really in these equity recaps for us. It's the larger single asset, highly structured transactions. As Ralph said, that you know a lot of these deals have to unwind. It's just a question of do you have the right lender and operator and capital structure going forward. Sector-wise, um, some of this was mentioned on a prior panel, um, you know, single family, whether it's outside of New York and D.C., whether it's condos um, or, you know, single family, um, the, the chart earlier, if you read the paper, you'd assume that no one ever wants to buy a house again. People actually are buying houses. They're just not buying them at the same level with the same kind of leverage. So, you know, you can't spend a lot of money doing this, but I still think that end of the market is still truly distressed. So for distressed investors, playing in that um, might be a good opportunity for people. So I think the biggest opportunity in 2012 is going to Italy and Greece and getting a cheap vacation. <laughs> Uh, that, that's what we should all look forward to because that's certainly going to happen. Just quickly, Wendy, coming from the, the end, are we optimistic about the future? Neutral or, 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 or pessimistic? Can we talk market specific? I, I'm a bull on New York. I believe New York and Washington, D.C. are you know, two great cities, not only by our country standards, and I'm certainly a believer in America, but by world standards. I think Europe is going to go through a hard time, but I think they're going to figure out you know, what they need to do as well. So overall, I'm optimistic. Richard? Definitely optimistic. But you got to have a longer term perspective. You know, yeah. in the short run, it, things are going to be incredibly difficult. Uh, and, you know, we've got to work through huge over leverage, uh, not just in, in the real estate industry, but basically in the economy generally. Uh, and it's not just in Europe, it's here in the United States as well. So a lot of political risk, a lot of economic risk, a lot of difficult times ahead over the next few years, but ultimately we'll prevail and, and things will be fine. Ralph? I'd say uh, generally optimistic. I think the only place on the decision tree that we all get screwed is if we're in a high rate environment with no growth. Obviously there's some <coughs> probability of that happening that should be embedded in the spot market price at which we're all transacting. As long as that spot market price is fair and realistic, I think uh, there will be lots of ways to make money. I, I'm optimistic too, but I would say it's uh, going to be a volatile uh, environment and you have to have the stomach and staying power to live through that volatility. So I think as the trend is going to be uh, positive ultimately, you're going to have a lot of ups and downs, uh, albeit I'm, I'm, as, as uh, Wendy I think said well, I'm very bullish on, on New York as a, a true uh, global city. Uh, but even that I think is, you know, seeing a little bit of a pullback. Um, but eventually, I think that's going to have a significant spike. Well, if everyone's optimistic, I have to be pessimistic yeah. because it's just <laughs> the nature of who I am. Um, I would just say that uh, we're going to go through, I, I believe we're going to go through a period of time of incredible wealth redistribution globally. And it'll happen in the form of taxation and it will happen in the form of monetary policy. And I think that. Uh, we will disguise, when I say we, I'm speaking in the global way, but I really mean governments of the world, so it doesn't mean any of us. We'll do a good job of disguising that pain through monetary policy. And I think that um, 
we may not be doing so well, but we may think we're doing better than we are, which has probably been the case for the last decade and maybe even more. I'm a little bit like Ethan. I'm short-term pessimistic, longer-term optimistic. I think the delevering of the public sector has barely begun. Um, I think going into an election year, both sides just like to say how awful, awful it is and they're the savior, and I think that that affects the psyche and how consumer feels. So until we pass through another election, and they're going to put off the tough decisions on the, on the public debt. Um, so I think short-term, you know, it's going to affect real estate whether it's real estate taxes, all these fees, lots of things. I do think we work our way through it, so that's why I'm a short-term pessimist and, and a long-term optimist. I've always been an optimist, so uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm hopeful. So anyway, uh, we have a great afternoon. It's a very special afternoon, so stay. Um, the best is yet to come. And I want to thank this panel. I know all you guys for many, many years. And so uh, thank you very much. We have no time for questions. We'll see you at lunch.